Hi everyone and welcome to video 1.4, an introduction to online learning in the course EDUC 2160, Online Learning Theories and Models. So just to get you primed uh, to watch this content and to listen to the content, I'd like you to start thinking about some of the advantages of online learning and some of the challenges, as well as some of the ways you can create a blend and why would you want to. And then finally, what is the role of the educator in online learning and what is the role of the learner? So let's start with what is online learning. In 2004, the Advisory Committee of Online Learning defined it as what occurs when education and training are delivered and supported by networks, such as the Internet or Intranet. That's a very broad definition, but it highlights the flexible and dynamic nature of the online environment, which is the characteristic that makes it possible to engage in learning anytime from any place. Online learning can take a variety of forms, and we're going to talk about that as we work through this session. What I'd like to suggest you do is take a look at this little YouTube video. It's by Pearson Education. It's focused primarily on K-12, but it gives a nice perspective on what others are saying online learning is or is not and some of the benefits around online learning. So some of the key messages that I'd like you to take away from this session are that student learner expectations are changing. Technology is increasingly part and parcel of learning and it's just uh, one of those things that is an expectation now. The role of the educator is still essential to the process. This does not mean that teachers, educators, trainers are going to lose their job. We still need people to guide and direct as we work through this learning experience. And the possibilities are limited only by our imaginations. The technology toolkit grows rapidly. It grows rapidly every day. And so it's our creativity and our imaginations that allow us to create learning environments that are effective and efficient for our learners. So what is online learning made up of? Lots of it started with audio conferencing, video conferencing, and distance learning materials. You know, the pizza box kind of idea. And then learning management systems came into play, and these allowed one place for all of these materials to sit. So in our course, we're using a learning management system called Blackboard. Then we got some synchronous tools, and early on they went by lots of different names. Um, Illuminate was one of them, Connect, Collaborate. Uh, the one we're using in our course is Adobe Connect. And now there's all the Web 2.0 possibilities. So there's wikis, there's blogs, there's social software, there's Web 3. Point, and I put a D there. Um, the D is what's coming next. Within social software, there's Twitter. There's lots of people that are using different social software in their learning experience, their, their blended learning experience. So it is a bit of a panic. If you haven't been in this environment before, if this is not where you've been learning before, it can cause your hair to raise, hence the, the little cartoon. Um, but the thing to remember is that the more powerful technology becomes, the more indispensable good teachers are. And Michael Fullen just states it very clearly. Technology generates a glut of information but it has no particular pedagogical wisdom, especially how learners must construct their own meaning. And that's the role of the educator, is to guide and help learners figure out ways to construct their own meaning so they can have that deep understanding. So some of the intersection points in online learning, in this diagram, you can see there's sort of three main areas, the student, the educator, and the content. And then in behind it, sort of on the plate, there's the different levels of learning that are required. So if you think of Bloom's taxonomy, there's a different type of technology that you're using and all of the affordances it has. And there are the different instructional strategies you can use to help the educator, the student, and the content come together. And then in the middle there is the social interaction. And that's really where you need that discussion, you need the, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, you need the gnashing about of ideas as people start to integrate what they're learning into their prior knowledge, to make some adjustments, um, to decide where they sit with different things that are being presented to them. And you'll notice as we go through our course that many of the tutorials and the online discussion won't be definitive for you that you'll end up 
pondering and reflecting and thinking about what was discussed. So what are some of the considerations when you're thinking about online learning? Well obviously who are the learners? Who are they? What are their characteristics? And then we need to look at the content. What type of content are we working with? What does it come in? Is it is it Word documents? Is it heavy diagrams? Is it how to do air brakes on a locomotive? What's the content? And then of course what is the context? What time of day, class size, delivery method? Are we looking globally for example? As this program expands, how does that impact our synchronous sessions and the times available? And then we're looking at the technology. What technology is available? What's scalable? What's sustainable? What's uh, stable? And what is the role and purpose of using technology in the program? And finally, assessment. What are the intended outcomes of the course, of the program? How will they be measured? How is that congruent with the learners and what their needs are, the content and what needs to be conveyed, the context and using it in the real life setting, and the technology that's been used throughout the program. So one often, in, in case many cases, that we talk about now is blended learning. And so what's in a blend? And you can have a variety of blends, face-to-face -face in an online course, face-to-face -face in online resources. Some people are talking about that as the flipped classroom. Synchronous and asynchronous resources. You could do synchronous and face-to-face. -face. Online course and social software. The blend and the way you can f can make your blend, it really is up to your imagination. It's, it's limitless, but it needs to be grounded, if you think back to that diagram, in the context, the content, the learners, and the overall intended outcome. So what are some ways that we're doing online learning that aren't just course notes online? We have, unfortunately, uh, pre- Web 2.0, the initial start of online learning was a lot of books put online. Word documents, people took their course notes and just dumped them online. And of course, as a result, many learners unplugged because it wasn't engaging, it wasn't motivating, it wasn't useful. So what are ways that are beyond the course notes online? PowerPoint with embedded audio, so something like what you're watching now. A variety of practice and assessment tools. Um, there's some different software out there, lots of different options to really start to get at a deeper level of assessment than the multiple choice question you see on the screen. Online discussion forums, being able to post, reflect, contemplate, read others' postings, add in your own comments. Um, within the context of an online discussion, you can do lots of different instructional strategies such as debates, mock trials, some role plays. Uh, you can s assign different roles for discussions to really have it be engaging and meaningful. Learning objects are also other opportunities or options for online courses. Um, what you're watching right now could also be considered a learning object. And so there's lots of different ones that are available and there's a link on the slide that would be worth pursuing if you haven't already examined Merlot. Um, it's a, a repository of a variety of learning objects built by everyone from academics to K-12 teachers and even some corporate trainers in there on different topics. So it's worth taking a look to see what they have. Wikis, editable web pages. This is a, there are a couple of great examples here. Lots of K-12 use of wikis, um, collaboration on group assignments. No doubt in this course you'll be using a wiki or a Google Doc, for example, um, which is similar. Uh, as you work and you plan and you plot your, your problem-based learning approach. Blogs, um, Twitter, using blogs as a way to be that sort of online journal, that chronological progression as you're coming to sense and making your sense of the content. Using Twitter as a form of a microblog in real time, what's happening, what's going on. So I've given some examples there. This is a great one um, from different elementary school classes that they're doing. I mean, it's dated 2007, uh, but it's definitely a valuable example of showing at that time uh, someone who is very much at the cutting edge. Podcasting, vodcasting, adding in audio links, uh, sourcing, creating your own mashups where you're sampling different video or audios from other sources and putting them all together. And then learning communities. This is an example of one that was live in British Columbia supporting uh, British Columbia K-12 educators. And there was an entire educational program with guest speakers every month that was tied into what a, an educator would need sort of at the start of school, when you hit November, uh, when you're moving into April, that sort of thing. And so this was the opportunity for people to get in and build their own online community with the support of a very, very 
active and present online community facilitator. And then there's personalized learning environments. This is an example of one that was done for Newfoundland and Labrador, where people could go in. But you see them quite common now. Um, TELUS's homepage be considered one. You can use Symbaloo to create your own. Google, iGoogle is another example of a personalized learning environment. Basically, where everything that you need is uh, is right at your fingertips as you're creating your own learning. There's also the synchronous learning. And that's what we'll be doing in the course through the tutorials. And this is where there's the interaction between instructors and students, in between other learners in real time. It could be one way or two way. You can participate by text or audio, but it happens at the same time. And there's different examples there. We've talked in another video about the formal um, go to meeting is a good example there, or informal such as Skype. And then, of course, as you move further out on the web, there's always Second Life and, uh, and other options where it's really like that virtual reality. And we'll spend some time later in the course talking about that. So all of these, and I've just done a very quick overview, are examples of different technology pieces that could be part of an online course that are, could be part of online education. So what do all these pieces bring us? It allows us the ability to focus on our teaching practice, gives us a larger set of tools um, to reach our learners. It expands our existing system and provides broader opportunities for learners within the system. So instead of being in a lockdown brick and mortar setting or being in a classroom or a hotel ballroom sitting in the seat and you have that one day opportunity for professional development or for training or learning, this allows us the technology toolkit to put some bookends on that to have a pre and a post to create an online community building out of an event and then it helps us do what we do better so as educators we can reach students we can facilitate learning we can customize learning to students because it isn't one size fits all and so it allows us to sample and use different pieces in order to reach students in a more effective way so the challenge for educators is to think of a learning environment that can be created with technology, your online learning environment, your online course, and then try not to use technology simply to automate the past. And so a classic example of this is when online courses first started out, everybody wanted to create the the pub online or the lunchroom or the cafeteria online for students to go to hang out because that's what they do on a face-to-face -face setting and of course they failed miserably nobody went to those places because there was no motivation to go there and so try not to use the the models that are in your mind of what it could be and try to think beyond that box and really explore what could an online environment be? What could an online course be if you have all these tools at your fingertips? So what does it take? An openness to learn, a willingness to try out something new, a reflective beginner attitude, collaboration and support, time to explore, and of course a sense of humor. Uh, this is a little graphic from work that I've done with administrators in China who are moving into the online setting. And for them it took big ears to listen big eyes to open and see, a small mouth so that they didn't interject their opinion all the time, um, short gray hair because they were doing a lot of thinking, and of course the professional business suit because uh, in that setting the role of an educator is definitely one that is growing into a profession. So all of this discussion about online learning, for many of you, depending on your background, depending on your work environment, this may be old hat. And for some of you, this may be very new, and in that sense very overwhelming and so to that end I would encourage you with this cartoon to uh, to yes take a deep breath and uh, and dive in with us into this course in the discussion forums in the tutorials let's pull apart what are some online learning theories and models and examine how they can be useful in your setting in your environment and what are the challenges um, and the advantages of doing so so for the synthesis questions some things to consider, how does the role of the educator change in the online environment? Is that different than a face-to-face -face setting? What about the role of the learner? And is that different? If so, how? And what supports are required for the learner in the online environment? 
So we'll spend some time talking about these in our tutorial sessions this week as you explore and get into what is online learning. And uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.